Hey, hello Physical Science, this is Mr. B, and we are going to start our last section of Chapter 14. The title of this section is Simple Machines, so hopefully you have maybe um, heard of these before. Uh, so there's kind of going to be a longer section, so we're going to break it up into two parts. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump right in. So, um, Simple Machines, um, we're going to have to deal with the output of one device, how it acts on the input of the next, and uh, this is just kind of a funny example of maybe an over or uh, dramatized uh, simple machine here. So it's actually a way to raise your car up if you get a flat tire. So you can look through that and see all the different steps that uh, have to go into here for this machine. So we're going to look a little more practical and a little more realistic than that. But that's just kind of a funny way uh, to introduce the concept of different types of simple machines. And there are actually going to be six types of simple machines, so I'd maybe jot these down now. Uh, we're going to hit on the first three today, the lever, the wheel and axle, and the incline plane. Then we have the wedge, the screw, and the pulley are going to be our next three. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in with the lever. And our definition of lever is a rigid bar that is free to move around a fixed point. And the fixed point that the bar rotates around is known as the fulcrum. Now there's going to be a lot of vocabulary words associated with the lever here early on. I would definitely write down these first two, the lever and the fulcrum, because these are really important. And uh, um, they might not, this might not make much sense now, but we're going to see they have some really good pictures here that help make this fulcrum, which is, again, the fixed point that the bar rotates around. Um, they have a real-life example, then they have little diagrams that are going to make it a little bit easier to understand. And a couple other uh, um, terms that are going to be used in here are the input arm of the lever is the distance between the input force and the fulcrum, and the output arm is the distance between the output force and the fulcrum. And again, there will be some pictures here that might make this uh, make a little more sense. And levers are going to be classifi classified into three categories based on locations of their input force, the output force, and the fulcrum. So. Um, bear with me here. Again, this will try to make a little bit more sense with these terms here. So the fulcrum of a first class lever is always located between the input force and the output force. And so depending, so this I would definitely write this down for the first class lever. That's between, the fulcrum is between the input force and the output force. And depending on its position, uh, the first class lever can have any different type of mechanical advantage. And so our example of a first class lever. So if you look here, we have our input force, which is the hand holding the screwdriver. Our fulcrum is right here, the can of paint. And our output force is going to be um, when the can lid is actually raised up. So our fulcrum, the fixed point, which with the bar is rotating around, is in between our input force and our output force. So input force is right here. The output force is going to be over here when the can raises up. So the screwdriver is being used as a first class lever and because of the location of the fulcrum it has a mechanical advantage that's greater than one. So first class lever, the fulcrum is between the two forces. So we have the hand raising up and it's going to rotate around this fixed point which is the can of paint and then the, once the lid pops up that is going to be our output force. So that is what a first class lever looks like. Again the fulcrum is in between the two forces and then a second class lever is the output force is now located between the input force and the fulcrum. So now our two forces are next to each other and the fulcrum is kind of on one end or the other. And the input distance is going to be larger than the output distance, so we're actually going to have to put more work in than what, uh, move more distance. And the mechanical <coughs> advantage of a second class lever is always greater than one. Uh, so they just give that, uh, just so you're aware, I don't know if I'll ever test you over all the mechanical advantages. There might be a couple, but uh, again, I would just maybe wrote, write down for second class lever that this is probably the most important part right here. And our example of the second class lever is the wheelbarrow. So we said the output force is now in the middle. So our input force is us lifting the wheelbarrow up by its handles. That's the force we're putting in. The output force is how high whatever our load is moved, our whatever we are holding in the wheelbarrow is moving so the flowers the moving of the flowers is our output force and the fulcrum the fixed point here is the wheel so <clears throat> the output force is now in the middle between our input force and our fulcrum so that's a second class lever the output force is in between the input force and the fulcrum and 
Again, these pictures right here, these diagrams are probably going to show up again uh, later on. So I will probably go over those more in class just so we are aware. So that's a second class lever. Now our third class of levers, now our input force is going to be between the fulcrum and the output force. So that is kind of our last uh, option there. And the output distance over which the third class lever exerts its force is larger than the input distance. And therefore our mechanical advantage is always going to be less than one. And again, I think these make more sense. So again, probably writing this down is our most important part. And this will make more sense when we actually see our picture. So now we have a broom handle. So our fulcrum is right up here at the top. That's our fixed uh, location here that it is rotating around. And the hand is the input force, so that is what is actually moving the broom. Because again, you don't actually move the broom with your top hand very much. That's kind of holding it steady. You use your um, other hand to move it. And then the output force is the actual broom head moving through and sweeping up. Um, whatever you are using it for. So the output distance of the broom is greater than the input distance the hands move through. So um, you don't have to move your hands very far and then that broom is going to be moving a lot farther. So fulcrum is right here. Input force is in the middle. So it's your hand. That's what you're doing. And then the output force is the broom head moving. So those are our three types of levers. And again, these pictures right here, being able to look at those pictures, those diagrams, are probably going to show up to be able to for you to identify the difference between our three different types of levers. So our next one is a wheel and axle. And we know we're not going to worry about calculating the ideal mechanical advantage. Uh, maybe just use this to fill out your guided notes, but we're not going to do any problems with the wheel and axle. Uh, but you will need to know that a wheel and axle is a simple machine that consists of two discs or cylinders in each one with a different radius so they're not the same the one is going to be bigger than the other and the outer disc in our system is the wheel and the inner cylinder is going to be the axle and the wheel and axle rotate together as a unit so they both move when one moves the other one moves and uh, there's multiple ways that we can exert forces on our wheel and axle so we can apply first the force to the wheel so the bigger one the outer disc is the wheel so which uh, or whichever one's located on the outside and so when that has happened the input distance is larger than the output distance and therefore our mechanical advantage is going to be greater than one but if we apply our force to the axle the output distance is larger than the input distance and then the mechanical advantage is there is going to be less than one and so kind of get into a little picture to make this make a little bit more sense so again wheel and axle so <clears throat> we have the steering shaft and then a screwdriver is actually an example of a wheel and axle as well so again the outer disc is going to be the wheel in this case it is a steering wheel and the steering shaft is going to be our axle portion and then the screwdriver handle is actually the wheel if you will and then the screwdriver shaft is going to be the axle portion so that is our second type of simple machine and then our last one is an inclined plane and again this is has to deal with my ideal mechanical advantage we're not going to calculate that out but uh, if you need that to fill out your guided notes there it is um, but an inclined plane is a slanted surface along which a force moves an object to a different elevation so uh, basically just like a ramp is probably the simplest example of an inclined plane uh, the distance traveled is your input distance the change in height of the ramp is its output distance and then the mechanical advantage is always going to be greater than one and uh, example another one not a ramp is this long and winding road acts like an inclined plane to help you move up the mountain so again it's just a way to change elevation that's the main idea for an inclined plane so that's it for the first part again I know that's a lot uh, just be familiar probably the main three types being able to identify what their differences are uh, and things like that and then we'll go again we will go over these in class so uh, uh, that's it for this one. Let me know if you have any questions.